as we go through and see what God has done in Mephibosheth's life, I want you to see yourself in this picture. And I got to move quick today because I got a lot to unpack for you so that y'all can get out of here and go to Golden Corral before it gets crazy. But, uh, but, but I want you to see Mephibosheth. So let me, let me help everybody. And if you didn't hear the last three um, sermons, please go to transformchurch.us and you can watch all of them, share them. Um, but basically, we have a young man named Mephibosheth. He was in line to be the king of Israel. Um, his granddad and his dad, Saul and Jonathan, they get killed. And word comes back to the castle. They try to gather up everybody. His nurse grabs him and she drops him. When she dropped him at five years old, he became crippled. For many, 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 many years, Mephibosheth lived in a place called Lodabar. Lodabar means a place of nothing, a place of not a word, a place of no pasture, kind of like where a lot of us are living, in a place that just seems monotonous. Nothing is happening in our life. I go to the job, I come home, I wait for the weekend, I try to do something fun, I go back to, to, to the week and I do it all over again and I try. It's just a place of nothing, a place of no purpose. And he lived there in cycles. See, see, that's a word for many of us, cycles. Many of us have one-year cycles, six-month cycles, two-day cycles. What are those things that just, it just keeps happening and we, we, we continue to allow it to happen and we continue to allow it to be in our lives, but it's producing nothing. Mephibosheth was in that place and then one day, King David is in, is in power now and he says, man, you know what? Is there anybody left of the house of Saul that I can bless? Because I had a real relationship with this guy named Jonathan. And he was like, and, and I, I want to bless him. Is, does anybody know, is there anybody, a son, grandson, nephew, cousin? And this one guy named Ziba, who used to serve in Saul's court, he said, yeah, there's this one guy. He's crippled. He, he stinks. He lives in Lodabar. His name is Mephibosheth. And he was trying to disqualify him, like many people try to do by what we've done. He's a liar. He used to be addicted. Oh, yeah, she gets around. They, they, oh, yeah, no, you, you don't want to use them. You, you don't want to use them. They're on their third marriage. Oh, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. You don't even know his attitude. People try to judge you on what you used to be. And the king is so beautiful, he didn't even probe for more information. He said, if he's the, if he's the uh, kin to Saul, go get him. They go get him. They bring him to the palace. And Phibs at this point is tripping. Because he thinks, yeah, I shortened his name, Phibs. Mephibosheth, that's very long. <laughs> Phibs is tripping at this moment because he's like, they're going to kill me. I, I, I've literally been hiding out. I am the heir to the throne, but I'm crippled. I don't even want it. He gets in the king's presence, and what does he do? He bows down, and he says, God, king, David, I'm not even worthy to be used. I'm not worthy for anything. I'm broken. I'm damaged. And then the king gives him a promise, just like our king gives you a promise. In your damaged state, in your damaged plate, he said, I want to bless you. I want to restore to you everything that was taken from you. I want to give you a position and a place, and you will always eat at the king's table. Now, why is this significant, Pastor Mike? I'm just trying to catch you up. It's because Mephibosheth was damaged in his legs. The part that was messed up was his legs. But when he got a seat at the king's table and he pulled up a chair... His damaged area was covered. This is a picture of grace in your life that many of us have not received. We're still pushed out from the table. Look, God, look at me. God, look how jacked up I am. God, me and my marriage, we went through eight years ago. God, I still didn't have a father. God, this, that, and the third. And all God said, pull up your chair. Receive my grace. Receive what I've done because it covers 
And this message I want to teach to you today is called chained reaction. Because when God extends his grace to you, there's a chained reaction. Have you ever seen dominoes? Like when they set up a whole bunch of dominoes, like in different designs. I know they did one with like 10,000 cell phones one time. Like you set them up and then you, you knock one down and then all of them, it's like a chain reaction. Or I don't know if anybody played this game when they were younger, but y'all remember the game Mousetrap? Anybody remember Mousetrap? And it was a game full of chain reactions. I, I want to help you understand something. As damaged people that we all raised our hands and said in some area, emotionally, physically, in our family, we're damaged in some area. Okay. There's a chain reaction when the grace of God comes to your life. There's a chain reaction. And I want you to understand what God does when grace comes to your life. Pastor Mike, what are you saying? Grace, the unearned, unmerited, undeserved favor, kindness, and goodness of God on your life. The job you work, you don't even deserve it. And you know it. The, the, that promotion, that opportunity that God gave when you were supposed to get in trouble for that thing. And they somehow just, but you, you, it's the undeserved, the unearned, the unmerited favor and kindness and goodness of God. That's grace. That's what we receive at salvation. Many people think at salvation we receive a bunch of rules. That's not what we receive at salvation. We receive the grace that covers us when we mess up in the rules. But, but, but if you don't receive the grace, you can't walk in it. And today there's a lot of damaged people who think that God is out to get them instead of God is out to save them. And I came to talk to you this morning because when you receive the grace of God, there are chain reactions and everything starts happening. Look what the word says in Luke 19 verse 10. This is one of my favorites to tell people who think that God is after them. It says, for the son of man came to seek, that means he's looking for you, and save those who are perfect. Those who got it together, the, 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 he said, I came for those who are lost, damaged, broken, frustrated, disappointed, depressed. That's who God came to save. So if you're any of those things in this place and you came in here and you buttoned up and you look all good and all that other stuff, stop faking. God came to save you from that lost place in your life. You acting like everything's okay, but if it's okay, cool. But if it's not, God says, I'm here to heal those damaged areas in your life. And so what ends up happening is we get to see a chained reaction. I'm going to give you two chained reactions that happen when grace comes into your life, when God begins to change you. The first chain reaction is God is going to restore. Everybody shout at me, restore. Restore. This is one of the best words in your life. God is a God of restoration. Yes, he is. Let me help you understand this. When Mephibosheth gets in with the king, he thought the king was going to destroy him. And the king wanted to restore him. You're thinking that God sometimes has a plan to, oh, it's time for the punishment, it's time for the... He said, no, 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 no. I want you to walk with me so I can restore you. Mephibosheth was borrowing a room in somebody else's house. And one moment in the king's presence, he went from the borrower to the lender. You missed it. When you get in the presence of God, when you allow him to work on your heart and when he can get into a place, he can take you. He can skip steps that you think you have to make. He can skip them. You missed it. Mephibosheth, get the picture. He's borrowing a room in another man's house. One interaction with the king. He goes from being the borrower to the lender. He, Y'all don't believe me. Let's go to the Bible. Y'all don't even understand what the word restore means. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 7. I, I want you to understand because receiving God's grace is the greatest thing you can do. Look, look what the word restore means, to bring back, to return someone or something to a former condition, place, or position. God wants to restore you. 
2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 7, this is what the king says, like he says to you, don't be afraid. I intend to show you kindness because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul. God can restore the generational blessings that have been lost. And some of y'all are like, the generational blessing? I don't even know my granddaddy. There were things that God wanted to do for your granddad and your grandmother and your great-grandmother that nobody in your family line has stepped up and said, oh, it's me. But God said one moment of getting in the right position with me. I won't just give you what you deserve. I'll go back and give you the favor that was on your grandmama and your granddaddy. The property that was supposed. Some of y'all don't have the faith to believe it. Can I give you a real example? My grandparents, my grandmother particularly, Leola Jones was a minister of the gospel. But she did it in her home. She, She never got to to go to the platforms and the stages and, and do the things that, that was in her to do. And, and, and it, she passed that mantle on to my mother and, and, and she began to do greater exploits than, than even what, what, what they got to do. But see, guess what? There's a generational thing. That stuff my grandmama was supposed to walk into and things my mom was supposed to walk into. I started in ministry with a church paid off (laughs) no no you missed it see I started I started I started with the generational blessing of what was not received what was not captured what may have been dropped God said I'm the God who can take you from the apartment to the five bed you got 10 kids you need all them rooms I I don't know who came in here with faith this morning, but we serve the God who wants to restore you. You thought you lost it? God says, look at my record. You thought you lost time? Look at my record. I'm the God that took 400 years of slavery for the children of Israel, parted the sea, gave them a promised land. They didn't want it. They wandered around for 40 years, but they kids, 20 and under, they walked into a promised land. Ah! Land flowing with milk and honey. The children ended up with what was supposed to be the parents. Because they had the faith to believe God would restore. And I don't care who you are in this place. God's plan for your life. It's restored. Well, we've just been in a household full of divorce and divorce and divorce and divorce. Shut that crap up. Because if you want God to make you have a rock solid marriage and he's a restorer. But everybody say you got to have faith. You got to have faith because God wants to restore you from a failing marriage to an example marriage. From being mean and angry to loving and patient. God will restore your attitude. Yes. See, see, God's not trying to just give you money, house, and a car. He's trying to give you love, joy, peace. And it can't come by money. If it came by money, there's no way superstars with millions of dollars would kill themselves. But peace only originates in one source. And that's the Father God. And he wants to restore you. Just look at your neighbor and say, restore. Like God wants to restore you. I want to speak faith into somebody because I feel this thing right now. How many people need a healing in your life in any area? Physical? Um, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. If you need a healing, I'm about to speak a scripture over you. And this is a scripture that God wants you to be restored in. Jeremiah 30, 17. Come on, if if you're ready to receive some healing right now, the Bible says, but I will restore you to health and I'll heal your wounds, declares the Lord. Somebody shout restore. What are you saying, Pastor Mike? If God is giving you a word right now, you shouldn't declare another scripture for the next 10 days except that one. This is what my God said. He said, I'm going to restore your health. (coughs) 
while I'm coughing. God, you said you're going to restore my health. Ah, why the pain is in my side. God, you said you're going to restore my health and you're going to heal my wounds. I'm trying to teach you not just to come to church and eat a fish. I'm trying to teach you how to fish. When God gives you a promise and you receive the grace of God, you have to begin to say, I know what the doctor said. I know what my kids are doing. I know what my wife did, but you said you would restore. Somebody shout at me, restore. restore. How many people have lived a life that they're, there's some shame and disgrace in your past, some things you did that you wish you wouldn't have done? Come on, come on, let's be honest. Come on, raise your hand in this place. There's freedom coming in this place this morning. Isaiah 61 7 I want to speak this over you right now instead of your shame you will receive a double portion oh y'all instead of the disgrace you will receive your inheritance and so you will inherit a double portion in your land and everlasting joy will be yours somebody shout restore God promises whatever shame has been in your life, he'll give you a double portion of joy. Listen, the, the word of God is alive, but it only starts moving when, when, you, when you release it. It's like having a box of bullets. And if you were coming to fight me, Vic, stand up. Vic, stand up. This is my personal trainer, Vic. One day I'm going to look like him, y'all. If Vic was an enemy of mine and he was coming at me and I had a box of bullets and I just picked them up and I started chunking them at him, there would be no power in that. But at the moment I put that bullet in the right weapon, he can be coming at me full blast. And with ease, bah, whatever enemy or giant is in my way, the bullet in the right weapon begins to take down the enemy. And many of us are taking the word and throwing them. <laughs> Devil, leave me alone. Let me. But God said, put it in my, put it in your mouth. But Be begin to declare what God has said over you. Begin to, instead of my shame, I will receive a double portion. Thank you, Vic. He, he, hear me. We're praying when things go bad, but God said, I've already given you my grace. And there's a chain reaction that happens. When you get grace, you get restored. So whatever's going on in your life, whatever's broken and jacked up, God wants to restore you. Just one more time with faith in you. I want you to shout restore. restore. Your finances are about to be restored. Your, your love, your family, your, it's going to be restored. What are you saying, Pastor Mike? It has to be something that you believe. God cannot supersede your belief. Even though he has the power to do everything. He has the power to do everything, but he has to agree with what you believe. And today I want to charge somebody that as you sit at the king's table, that his goal and objective for you is that you be restored. Some of you have had negative effects of wrong decisions throughout the years of your life. And God wants to redeem you. I'm going to give you one more scripture. Joel chapter 2 verse 25 says, I will restore the years. Yeah, because some of us have lost years in foolishness, lost years in our marriage, lost years in bad financial decisions. God said, I'm going to restore the years that the swarming locust has eaten, that the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, all these things that have come to take from you. He said, I'm going to restore all of those years, my great army, which I sent among you. He said, I'm going I'm to restore them. And then he said, you shall eat and have plenty and be satisfied I, I want somebody to get it that Mephibosheth when he came from Lodabar he didn't just get a meal in a holiday in room I, I want you to hear 
the king literally restored every, all the land that his grandfather had, which was the king. Now, it messed me up for a second because I was like, well, what king? What, what, what does David have now? He's king, but he restored all of the land that Saul had. It, it, God's not scared. He said, my kingdom is, is expanding. He said, I'm, I'm doing more than what you even can see. So I'll give you back what was yours because I got more. God says, I have plenty. I have more. I don't run out. But we believe for some reason that God is limited to our thinking and limited to what we see. He doesn't even work in this realm. God wants to restore back to you. You wanted to start that business five years ago and you said, well, I missed it back then. I guess the economy has changed and all of these other things. God will give you special favor that you'll be the only business that ever opened in that season and it will be the best thing that ever happened to you. What are you talking about, Pastor Mike? This church in the summer, statistics say that church attendance goes down in the summer. But since we've been here, every summer the attendance goes up. Why are you saying that? It's because when God decided to restore the church at this location it wasn't back to what it was it's supposed to go to another level i'm encouraging you i'm happier than y'all are about this I'm, listen i want you to hear me that what the enemy meant for your evil god is about to turn it around and he's going to restore you to a place of flourishing flourishing mephibosheth went from begging to flourishing he went from asking to giving away. He went from lost with no identity to purpose and giving other people identity. It's what God wants to do in your life. He wants to restore you. So King David restored Mephibosheth. He's good. So this was a damaged man who submitted to a mighty king. The king restored the damaged man. And the man's damaged areas were covered at the king's table. Yes. Now, this is where the fairy tale should end. And we should see another story come up. But it doesn't go like that. Um, I begin to look at this story and I got kind of discouraged. Because I was like, oh, hold on. The restoration was supposed to be the dun da 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 like, mm, and then it's over. But this is what I came to let you know in the chain reaction, when grace comes into your life, the first chain reaction is God will restore you. But the second chain reaction is that there will be opposition. And, and you need to know this or you're going to be thrown off. See, when God, when God restores you, there's haters watching. <laughs> when God restore you, everybody's not going to be happy you got restored. You can even have family members. You can even have co-workers and, and sons and daughters who when you get restored, they're going to be like, ah, great, great. Eating at the king's table now. It's great. But deep-seated, there's, there's, there's something in there. And you got to know this because this comes with your journey of elevation that God wants to take for you. Let, let me help you find out what I found out in the last two years. Even when it's good for you, everybody's not going to be happy. And, and, and either you know how to navigate this or, or you allow this to damage you again. What, what are you saying, Pastor Mike? My point number one for today. <laughs> Heal the areas always have the opportunity to be damaged again. See, that, that's what people don't tell you. They're like, you're going to be victorious. You're going to ride into the sunset. You're going to have it all. Shout restore. And then they shout restore. And then we go out and they get damaged again. And then they're broken. And God, I thought you said that we were, I was going to be restored. And I thought, I thought we shouted and we gave and we did all this. But you got to realize healed areas have the ability to be damaged again if those areas are not submitted to the king always. L let me help you. Uh, remember, there was, I'm, I'm going to show you because some of y'all don't know. And if you can help me with the pictures. Okay, there was a king, Saul, 
okay? Saul, remember Saul, okay? He was Samuel L. Jackson in my mind. That's Saul, okay? And then Saul had a son named Jonathan, okay? And Jonathan is there, okay? Those two die, okay? They have a son named Mephibosheth, okay? Mephibosheth is the one that gets restored, okay? He's sitting at the king's table now, okay? Is everybody following me? And then there was King David, who is now in rulership over all of Israel, okay? That's King David, okay? So the first two are gone. But there's another character that you don't focus on because you're excited about the blessing that's happening in Mephibosheth's life. But there's another character that begins to show himself after all of the restoration happens, and his name is Ziba. And this is Ziba. I don't know. That's just what he looks like in my head. Just a little weasel. You know what I'm saying? Like, man. Go to 2 Samuel chapter 9. Now, 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 watch where, now watch how Ziba comes into play. 2 Samuel chapter 9 verse 3. The king asked, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul? Don't, fo don't focus on David. Don't focus on Mephibosheth. Watch Ziba. Is there anybody I can show kindness to? Ziba answered the king. There's still the son of Jonathan. He lame in both of his feet. Where is, where is he, the king asked. Ziba answered, he's down at the house of Maker, son of Emil in Lodabar. So we can draw some context clues from this. Ziba and Mephibosheth were from the same place because Ziba served his grandfather and Mephibosheth was his grandson. So they grew up around each other. Ziba knew Mephibosheth through association. He knew his daddy name. He knew all the people around him. He saw him on Facebook. He saw him on Instagram. He knew about him. <laughs> Ziba knew him in his damaged condition. Because before he even said his name, he said his condition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like some of the people around you, oh, no, he's still a liar. Or no, she's still a, okay? Ziba knew where and how to, he was currently living. And, and, and this is some things that you want to see. All of this is what a lot of people know about us. They know where you're from. They know who you're associated with. They know what your perceived condition is, and they know where you're at currently. But Ziba thought his choice of negative, descriptive language to the king would uninterest uh, the king to Mephibosheth, but it didn't. The same way, listen to me, that people think what disqualifies you to them disqualifies you to God, and it doesn't. God sees that he wants to bless you, where you're going, the good future that's ahead of you. So I want you to picture this for a moment. The king brings this damaged dude from Lodabar because Ziba said it. He told him where he was. He comes into the king's palace and I can just see Ziba standing in the background. He about to restore him. Uh-uh. No, he ain't. Look at, his, look at his damaged areas. He's, not about, he's about to give him what? He's about to do what for him? What, what job did they just get? What promotion? Allowing the seed of jealousy, comparison, self-worth. There are people around you watching you and you praising God and worshiping and doing all this stuff and they watching and the enemy suggesting to them like a zibba, what, what? She scared me. <laughs> but the truth about it is, what she's feeling is, is what, what Mephibosheth was feeling. He's in the moment of rejoicing because everything that was lost is being restored. At the same moment, it reminds me of the saying, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Because at the moment I'm getting restored, there's a hater in the background. I'm telling you, there's some chain reactions to the grace that God has given to your life. Look, go to 2 Samuel chapter 9, and we'll look at verse 9. I want you to see it in the Word. It said, then the king summoned Saul's servant Ziba and said, now watch this, this is the kicker. He said, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. He said, I saw it. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him. See, 
to produce food for your master's house. But Mephibosheth ain't even going to be there. He's going to be eating at my table. I want you to see this. That he's back there watching like, oh, just, mm. and then he gets called to help him. And this is the thing you have to realize that God will surround you with people to help you sometimes that are only there for a season that are there that you're going to have to keep close watch, watch and pray, but they're not there to be your friends. They're there to produce for you. You missed it. They're not there to be your friends. They're there to produce for you. They got in this position and he said, now I, I could see him there. He's just sitting there talking to himself and he says, Ziba, he's, oh, oh yeah, yes, yes. He said, what I want you and all your sons, your 10 sons and their 15 servants, I want, I want all of them to now serve Ziba. He said, who? <laughs> Mephibosheth. Y'all know what I'm at. I want you to serve Mephibosheth. He, he said, oh, okay, um, Why? What, what, what's happening? And he's not saying it out loud, but this is what's going on in his head. Look at this. Ziba replied, yes, my Lord, the king. Verse 11, I am your servant and I will do all that you have commanded. And from that time on, Mephibosheth ate regularly at David's table like one of the king's own son. His damaged area was covered. He got help. In one day, he went from borrowing to having 35 servants. See, but at the same time he was restored is the same time he got an opposition. I want you to hear me say this. Opposition doesn't mean God is not blessing you. It, it honestly is the opposite. When you get opposition, it's a sign that God is really blessing you. See, some of y'all been looking at it all wrong. Well, the job and the, no, 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 no. That is a sign that the king is for you and he's trying to restore you and bring you into a great place, y'all. So, so, so let me help you. Point number two, restoration always requires repositioning. When God restores you to a place, all your friends can't still be your friends. Oh, I'm coming to your house. When, when, God, when God restores you, all the things you used to do, it, it has to be repositioned. It, it has to move around because I'm restored now. I'm not the same. I'm better than I was before. God has a plan for my, I have to move forward. So now I got to move these chess pieces on the board because you used to block me in this area. But God's saying, uh-uh, move them around, move them around, move that around. I got to move this around. I'm telling you, when God restores, it always requires repositioning. The problem is most of us want to be restored and keep everything regular. So you want to be a CEO of business, but you're still holding on to that high school excuse you don't like to read. You better reposition yourself. I love to read now. I, I, God called me to a position where I had to get equipped for what he called me to. If I was still holding on to the, I don't like to read. I don't like to read. Reading is boring. I'd rather watch the cliff notes. I'd rather see that. I would be disqualified for the blessing God had for me. But when he restores me, I got a reposition thing. No, Mike, you love to read. No, Mike, you have to wake up early. I've been waking up early every single day. Vic will tell you 6.30, 6.45 sometime. I'm sorry for being late a couple times. But most of the time, before 6.45, I'm walking in the jinx, a gym. And I'm, my body is like, go out. Go to sleep. Like, but God told me at the beginning of this year in our 21 days of prayer, he said, I only can bless your ministry to the, to the degree that your body can take it. He said, if you're going to jump on planes and come back home and do three and four services, he said, your body's not ready for that. He said, and so I'm only going to bless you to the level of your, your conditioning. And see, we're waiting on God to do something. He's waiting for something on you. He know if he gave you what you asked for, he'd kill you. And so what did I have to do? Because God's restored me. He has to reposition things. I went swimming last week, y'all. I went in the pool. 
I forgot. <laughs> I forgot how much swimming takes out of you. I did 10 laps and literally just wanted to fall asleep on the patio of the pool. But I said, Mike, this is what is necessary as God restores you. I don't know what it is for you, but what is God repositioning as he restores you in your life? See, see Mephibosheth, he, he got restored and Ziba got repositioned just from one of, one of David's um, servants to now he was in a management position over all of these people working for Mephibosheth. Now, check this out. It really was a promotion for him. It really was a better situation. He said, from now on, your family, all of them, have job security. He, he said, as long as Mephibosheth and his sons are there, your family's going to serve it. Now, watch. Ziba should have been killed because he was a servant of Saul. He was the servant of an enemy. And usually if you study anything about monarchies and stuff like that, when they come in and take over, they kill. It was the grace of God. He was still alive. But when you get wrong perspective, you take grace as entitlement. Like you deserve this and you deserve to be here. And this is mine. And I should have had this. And what happened was he took for granted the grace he had been given. He didn't just get to stay alive. He got a prominent position. He, why are you mad? You've been a servant since we met you. He was Saul's servant. He was David's servant. And now he's Mephibosheth's servant with a, a higher position as a manager. Why was he mad? Because his perspective was poisoned. I, I want you to hear me say this very clearly. Point number three, wrong perspective will turn promotion into a problem. Wrong perspective will turn promotion into a problem. Instead of rejoicing, when Mephibosheth re restored, he got jealous. He was jealous of the favor that was on his life. He didn't understand why the king would bless this damaged man. And you know what? If we be honest, there's sometimes we're, we're like Zippa. That when God blesses somebody else's family, if we're honest, we get a little jealous. Come, thank you for one amen. When, when they got the promotion and it looks like everything and they got married and their hair is not as good as yours and you, you know see what I'm saying? Whatever your criteria is, there's moments that we feel kind of like Zippa. But what I would encourage you is don't hate on people, rejoice with people. I mean, begin to, begin to celebrate. Oh, you got a promotion. Yes. Oh, you got it. I mean, even if you got to fake it until you make it. Because you keep jealousy out of your heart. Because if you get jealousy and envy and, 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 and covetousness in your heart, look what the word of God says in James chapter 3, verse 14. It says, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it's earthly and unspiritual and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be, will be disorder and every vile practice. That's the word of God. I say it like this. Jealousy is a gateway sin. Y'all heard like weed is a gateway drug. Jealousy is a gateway sin. Get jealous. You'll find yourself in places that you never thought you would be doing things you never thought you would do. Trying to chase something that was never yours. Hear, hear what I'm saying to you, church. Point number four, God wants to restore you, but he also wants you to rejoice when he restores others. Right. Guys, I'm trying to give us practical tools. This week, I want you to intentionally rejoice with somebody. I mean, intentionally. Like, make it not the little fake, oh, good for them. Uh -huh. Don't do that. Text them. You saw something good. Uh, when we opened our new campus, I can't tell you how many people text me or called 
and said, man, we are so excited for what God is doing at Transformation Church. And then that week, I went to a place where a whole bunch of pastors were at. And then um, they was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We saw your new campus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, because they didn't say it. But there were some that were genuinely excited that God expanded the kingdom. And there were others that felt as if, why did that happen? They only two years and why is this? Hear me. There is a blessing and you rejoicing with others. Don't just do it on the inside. Tell them. Be excited about it. Some of you need to get on Instagram or Facebook or text people. And when you see something that you're genuinely excited for, you need to say it. You don't know what you will do. You're beginning to work the muscle of gratitude that God can trust you with more. And Ziba didn't get it. So the seed of jealousy went into his heart. And he didn't understand this principle. So this is where we go. So Ziba disappears. Some years go by. I'm almost done, but I got to bring this thing real, real tight. I'm going to give you seven chapters of the Bible in one minute. And this is what I title the dysfunctional family of David. So David had two sons, one named Amnon, one named Absalom. Basically, Amnon did something bad to, to his sister, and so Absalom killed him. Absalom killed him, and David was like, boy, you can't kill your brother. Get out the house. And he sent him away, and he was like, I miss my boy. And he brought him back. And then what ended up happening is Absalom was like, my daddy, he a punk. He a buster. He sent me away, cuz, and I promise he ain't going to get away with that. And so what he did was then he started to get people, and the Bible says that he drew people to himself. He drew Israel to himself, and he made a plan to overthrow the entire kingdom. He said, I'm going to take my daddy out, put that on the set. And so what ended up happening is that him and his daddy, um, um, they, they got word that they were coming to invade. And so David literally with all his people, they said, ooh, ooh, and they said, it's time to go. And they grabbed all of the people in the kingdom and they fled out of the country that they were supposed to be in rulership over because his own son wanted to take over the kingdom. Somebody say dysfunctional. That is seven chapters of the Bible in one minute, okay? So the next time we see Ziba is in 2 Samuel chapter 16. When David had gone a short distance beyond the summit, they're running for their lives right now. There was Ziba, the steward of Mephibosheth, waiting to meet him. Now, I need you to see what, what, what has happened. Um, because... Ziba has now tried to position himself in the eyes of the king. Watch this. He had a string of donkeys saddled and loaded with 200 loaves of bread, 100 cakes of raisin, 100 cakes of fig skin and wine. And the king asked Ziba, why have you brought these? Ziba answered, the donkeys are for the king's household to ride on, sir. The bread and the fruit are for the men to eat, and the wine is to refresh and turn up those who are become exhausted in the wilderness. The king asked, where is your master? Where's Mephibosheth? Ziba said to him, he's staying in Jerusalem because he thinks today the Israelites will restore to me my grandson's kingdom. My grandfather's kingdom. Let me give you the remix. Mephibosheth is hoping that you get killed today because he would be next in line to take over the kingdom. He lied on him. Now, this is the thing you got to realize is that Mephibosheth sent Ziba to get his donkeys so that he could go be with the king. And Mephibosheth was left damaged again. Because Ziba never came back for him. He took what wasn't even his and presented it to the king like it was his idea. Here are the donkeys. Here are the wine. Here's the raisin cakes. I did this for you. Where's your master? He thinks that you're going to die today. He's not loyal to you. He lied on Mephibosheth trying to discredit and damage his whole name. 
And I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but there's some people out there will say whatever to whoever to try to damage your reputation. But, but let me help you. Let me help you see. If you're Ziba or you're Mephibosheth in this, I want you to see. If we go all the way back to 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 6, right there, Mephibosheth begins to be in despair and hope because remember, despair and, and with no hope because you have to remember that that's the place he was in in Lodabar, alone, by himself, damaged. And now after he's been restored, He's got all these servants and all this land has been restored. And guess where he's at again? Alone? By himself? And damaged. But this is the great thing that you have to realize. And I'm going to talk about it next week. That his response was completely different this time in a damaged area. Than it was when he first was in Lodabar. Because he sat at the king's table regularly. He had a different mindset. Because grace had been over his life for many years. When he got back down in a damaged place, he didn't respond the same. He didn't stay in that place. And what I came to let you know today is that there's a chain reaction. As God covers you with this grace, he's going to restore you. But at the same time, you're going to meet opposition. The question is, how are you going to respond? I want to show you this last point because there may be a few Zibas in the room. And if that's you, it's okay. You're a hater. No, 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 no. No, I'm, I'm just in your heart. Like in, in your heart, you, you, you don't. And it's okay because we, we know that God doesn't bless where you pretend to be. He blesses where you really are. But, but I, want you to, I want you to see this right now. The king said to Ziba after he lied on Mephibosheth. All that belonged to Mephibosheth is now yours. He literally lied to the point where everything that was restored back to him now got given to the liar. What do you do when your enemy gets elevated? Oh, we talk about the fruits of the spirit. Come on, let's be real. What happens when the person who abused you? gets a position of power. Well, what is our response as Christians, as believers, as ones who are supposed to turn the other cheek and let them slap the other one? And I want you to see what Ziba did. He said, oh, really? Me? You're going to give me all of Mephibosheth's land? He said, I humbly bow. May I find favor what was given to Mephibosheth. He's been jealous this whole time, and all he's wanted was favor from the king. May I find favor in your eyes. I want us to run back all the way to the first time Mephibosheth meets God when grace is extended to him. Mephibosheth does this same thing, and he bows, and he says, may I find favor and Ziba sitting back here watching, and the seed of jealousy got planted. One day, the king's going to give me his favor, even if I have to manipulate my way into that place. And it worked. Let me give you my last point. Jealousy matures into manipulation over time. If you become jealous, you'll begin to manipulate your way into whatever you want. But this is the beautiful thing about what you if you get something that's not yours, <laughs> that you have to sustain it. See, see, when you get into a place that's not yours, you have to hold it up. When you get into a place that God's placed you in, you can rest. What, what I came to help everybody understand is be content where God's placed you, where he has you, well, I didn't get in the four-year school. I thought I was going to be content right where you are. I, I'm not saying give up. I'm not saying that, that to desire more. 
But this is what I want to leave you with. And this phrase, God gave it to me, and I believe it's so good. You can believe God for more, but you cannot believe God for theirs. See, see, there's something when you believe God for more for yourself. God, I, I know there's more for me. I know you have more. But you cannot look at your neighbor to your left or your right and say, but I want what they have. Because if you get what they have, you'll have to sustain it. But if you get what God has for you, you can rest. 